The David Warner relationship with Sam also survived the test of time. Yeah, he's uh, David. David uh, was um, um, Sam's first choice for the preacher in Cable Hogue, and David at the time um, was scared of uh, was, was scared of flying and had to, literally had to take the boat to come to to shoot um, to to play the role on on Ballad Cable Hogue. He was then on Straw Dogs and then he was on Cross of Iron, and um, their relationship was um, was very strong and their friendship re re survived. And I know that for a fact that, uh, you know, when David Warner, um, when da David Warner was, uh, suffered his accident, Sam and I went to, went to visit him in the hospital. Um, and, um, you know, he was, he was there for David every snake of the way, and when, uh, when we hired, we hired him for straw dogs, and the and and the insurance wouldn't pay for um, uh, for Dave, uh, Dave, David Warner to be in the film because because of, because of, because of his accident, Sam said I'm I'm not going to shoot it without him. So Sam, I think I, I think Sam actually pay, either paid the insurance or said he wouldn't shoot the film if if David couldn't be in it. But there were some insurance problems and and. Uh, uh, Sam stood by David, you know, through thick and thin, and and David, David and him were were friends forever. Uh, I got a phone call, uh, not from my agent, but from Sidney Lumet, the director I'd worked with in, on The Seagull and uh, something else. Uh, strangely enough, with James Mason was in The Seagull and he was in Cross of Iron. And I got a call from Sidney Lumet totally out of the blue. It's not as if he called me every week or anything or any, uh, suddenly got, and he just said, David, he said, listen, he said, you're shortly going to get a phone call from somebody you've never heard of. His name is Sam Peckinpah. I've just seen a reel of, a, of the rough cut of um, his movie he's working on. I urge you to work with him. And about half an hour, I said, thanks. And uh, about half an hour later, I got a phone call from, uh, hello, my name is Sam Peckinpah. I, uh, and I said, yes, I've just had a call from Sydney about you. Uh, would you like to be in my movie if I send you the script? Uh, the script came along of Ballad of Cable Hogue. That was the, the film. And, uh, well, it was lovely. I mean, uh, to, to uh, get this part in a, to me, it looked like a Western. Uh, and uh, so, yes, that's how, that's how the first moment in my uh, collaboration or, or being part of Sam's world happened. Yes. So, I mean, I was enthusiastic to go. The deal was set and whatever that was. And the day before I was due to fly, to uh, the west coast of the United States. I'd been, to, I'd been to the States before, but I'd never been to the west coast. And I panicked, I had a panic attack or whatever, which I wasn't prone to, but I just suddenly could not fly. So I called my agent and I said, Julian, I can't do it, I can't go to America, I can't fly, I'm sorry, you'll just have to call them and say I can't do it. He said, you've lost the job, you know that. I said, yes, I know, I'm sorry, please give my, etc." Anyway, he put the phone down, I put the phone down. I thought, well, that's it. And I kind of breathed a sigh of relief. I don't have to get on a plane and go all the way from home and out of my flat and do anything. I could just go up, walk up Fitzjohn's Avenue to the pub, see John Hurt, you know, have a drink and do all that kind of stuff and not worry about leaving. I suppose I'm quite a bit of an agoraphobic or whatever. I think that's the word, isn't it? So anyway, four hours after the phone call to my agent saying I couldn't do it, he phones me back. He said, right, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take a train for Victoria and you're going to go down to Vic uh, Barcelona and you're going to stay the night in Barcelona and then uh, you're going to catch a boat, a ship, uh, the Michelangelo, and it's uh, going to take you across the Atlantic. It's going to take two weeks. Uh, you'll stop at some islands there and then you get to New York and then you get off at New York and then you go up to Chicago by train. You'll stay the night in Chicago and then you take this uh, train straight across the state to the West Coast. And I was absolutely dumbfounded. He said, Sam Peckinpah wants you to be in this movie. 
and this is what they've come up with. A two and a half week trip by, by ship, stopping off in the islands, first class. Anyway, I did the trip and then uh, got, got to, I think it was LA, and then they drove me from LA to the desert in Nevada, to the Echo Bay Resort, where they were on location, motel. And I get out of the car to, in this motel and I walk into the lobby and I say, excuse me, I'm looking for Mr. Peckinpah, Mr. Sam Peckinpah. He said, oh, he'll be in the Lizard Lounge. The Lizard Lounge, that's the bar, the bar there. They, called, they called it the Lizard They christened it the Lizard Lounge. And I walked in there and it was quite a dark place, but there was Sam, who I'd never met before and I didn't even know what he was. He said, hello. This is after two and a half weeks waiting for a, a, a character actor. They waited. And he said, hello, David. And he put out his hand. Welcome to the club. I assume by that he meant he didn't really like flying himself. <laughs> uh, and it was just, uh, that, that's all he said. And then I had a drink and then of course we made the picture. Uh, I was part of an extraordinary picture. You know that um, it was not an easy production as reported and within the industry was spoken of as the battle of Cable Hogue because of uh, problems with weather, uh, problems uh, with money, and, and Sam's own internal problems. Can you tell us a little bit about that, the battle of Cable Hogue? Well, uh, the battle of Cable Hogue, I suppose, on hindsight, bearing in mind that I had not filmed in the United States before, uh, and, uh, and I'd usually in the UK, being in studio pictures with the discipline, so we were right out in the desert. So as far as I'm concerned, as you, as you say, weather weather had problems. Um, that 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 happened, and it was, it was all on location, with one or two exception interiors. Uh, so there was that which nobody could control, and as you say, and of course is well documented. You know, Sam and even Jason at one or two days had various hiccups. <laughs> hiccups is a good word I suppose. And um, th that kind of stuff and, and there was also, you know, I, I kept myself to myself. I wasn't really involved too much in, you know, I would go to my room and then come out and do my work and, and go to the bar and, and not really be too much aware. Except there were a lot of crew, crew changes during it, you know, you'd suddenly find that, that, you, that somebody was on that. It was the they weren't being bussed back from Las Vegas to Los to sort of Los Angeles. But they, they flew. They were they almost had permanent tickets for crew to go back and forth, so fire half the crew, and then you know, so that was going on a lot. I heard. I wouldn't really have known unless anybody t told me. Uh, you know, the first AD wouldn't be there and be in somebody new, and there was all that going on, but. As far as I was concerned, that was quite normal on an American movie. I, I, uh, uh, so you only read later the, about the budget and about overshooting and about all, all that. I, I wasn't really aware of that. I mean, it, it, there was a lot of hard drinking and a lot of hard men there. I mean, how Stella Stevens was uh, really sort of was there surrounded by all these guys, you know, and a lot of kind of... I mean, I... I I was totally, I think, the only one totally opposite to the, uh, like Sam was had a reputation of being Sam and, uh, and the tough guys on the crew and the tough guys, and I wasn't like that at all. So I, I, it was, I was the cheese to their chalk or vice versa. On a personal level, he was always very gentle with me. I mean, I never had any feeling at all of any threat or... I had no fear of him. I think he warmed to me because I was a total opposite to everything around. And that's why, you know, he invited me back, and, uh, which is absolutely wonderful. So I was just sort of totally the opposite to any of that in, in my demeanor and the kind of person I am. Now, while we were filming Cable in the Echo Bay Resort, motel was our base, and we went out into the desert, every, you know, for two hour drives every day. At night, when we came back, 
Sam was off in the laundrette, which they converted into an editing suite. I never went into that laundrette or to the edit, but he was, and I learned only, you know, a month into filming, that every night Sam wasn't in the bar early, he was out editing. I was in there one night at about uh, midnight, and Sam came in for a drink, absolutely drained, and, he, and I said, are you okay? He said, yeah. He said, I, I'm, I'm trying to edit the last reel of my movie. I said, oh yeah, which I didn't know anything about, of course. Yes, the wild, uh, the wild bunch. The what we've seen, we've all seen. Anybody watching this has seen the last reel of the wild bunch. Well, Sam could not edit. Well, they were having difficulty finishing the picture. But I mean that just extraordinary last ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Anyway. And I want to correct something that I read in one of the biographies, because. We were making Cable Hogue with music, two gunshots, and I think, or maybe three, and uh, generally a sort of musical comedy in a way that he was making. Meanwhile, editing The Wild Bunch. And I remember Sam saying, when he came in to the bar, he said, so I'm so glad we're making this with music. He said, because I think I'm making my statement on violence. Now I read in one of the biographies, and I'm not trying to take issue with this, that, that, uh, that the, in the biography it said that Sam said he was making a statement on violence about straw dogs. No. While he was making gentle cable hogue, he said, I think I've made my statement on violence. What I'm trying to really say is he would have done, he would have gone in another direction if Cable had been accepted, because he'd made his statement on violence. But as we know, later on he did straw drugs and other kind of things, and I'm sure he had in there, when you talk about a gentle man, there was a lot of gentle stuff in there that he never got a chance to, um, to really express on film, in my opinion. But yeah, he made his statement on violence, and he couldn't, he couldn't edit the last reel of and I, I found out, really, having done three films, f Sam found it incredibly difficult to end his movies. For example, he, he did have difficulty with The Wild Bunch. When we did Straw Dogs, um, that very final scene with Dustin and myself in the car, th there was nothing there. He said, look, I, look can you guys go, go and finish? The he said, can you go and finish the movie for me? Uh, he said, improvise something. Well, of course, Dustin could improvise, but I couldn't. But he put us in this car at night, and, and they put a camera on front of the thing and, and had Dustin driving on the wrong side of the road for him. Uh, and we wrote off one car doing it. it well, you know, we weren't injured, but it just came off, so we had to, next night we had to film it. And I, I can't even remember what it was, but I, I couldn't make up dialogue. Uh, I think I said, uh, I can't find my work. He said, where are we going? I said, I, I, I don't know my way home. And he said, neither do I. And we drive off. Well, thank God it wasn't a 10-page improvised scene, you know, because I couldn't have sustained it. But, but what I'm trying to say is, that, and then if you see Cross of Iron, you get the feeling that maybe he didn't quite know because he asked James and Mason and myself to, re, re, to write, rewrite our last parting scenes, which we did. We wrote that. And Cable Hogue, the very last eulogy to Cable, I speak off camera while there were shots of all sorts of different things, because it wasn't written when we'd finished filming. They wrote that, they, he didn't know how to finish it, so he didn't know how to finish Cable Hogue. He had trouble with the Wild Bunch. He, did, he, he let us finish um, Straw Dogs. And also had James and Mason and myself write that parting scene where I get onto the mot motorbike. So I, I get, I don't know about the rest of his movies, but certainly those, those ones, Sam couldn't, he didn't end them himself, put it that way. It's very interesting, I think. Well, I um, talk, go back to Cable uh, uh, for a moment on actors, because I was reading conflicting reports from Stella uh, about A, the filming, and B, the cutting of, of her contribution to, the, to Cable Hope. And uh, 
it seems that there was a, a very emotional scene where she had to cry. And according to third party reports, Sam turned on her quite savagely, apparently, to the point that she burst into tears. And he justified that afterwards by saying that was in order to bring her emotionally to that point that he could then turn over the camera and film the scene as he wanted it, which is very moving. Assuming for a moment that that's true, and I rather suspect it, it is, what's your feeling about that as an actor? Um, I suppose it, it, I've had a couple of instances, but very minor, where the director obviously feels you can't do it and has to do something in order to get it out of you. Now, I, I, I just don't know. I don't particularly, I mean, if you cast somebody, I mean, if, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really like that, it, uh, but it's, it hasn't happened to be often, and I don't like when when a, when a director ha feels they have to do it because it means they don't think that the actor can do it. And I mean, I wasn't there for that particular story. I but mean, you must have seen, if not that, something like that happen with directors or with Sam even. Well, no, I can't. This, with Sam, I wasn't involved in any of those no. like type incidents. I mean, uh, I suppose. Uh, if he wants a, a jump reaction, he would surprise you with a, a, a gunshot, or, and, and then he'd use it somewhere else or something, which kind of would slightly annoy me. I say, give me a chance to act it first, and then shout at me and make me cry. I mean, that's what I would what I would say. Uh, but I mean, again, as I say, Stella was surrounded by you know guys all the time, and um, I believe I believe that story although I wasn't a victim of that particular kind of behavior with Sam at all. Um, and I, I think they, they should give the actor the, ch the chance to, you know, not to be able to do it. So I don't know, but I, uh, you hear lots of stories and I believe that one and uh, it's nothing I particularly approve of, but I think people have done worse things. What distinguished Sam as a director of actors? As far as, look, I was working, lucky enough to work with, three extraordinary actors. Jason Robards, who really didn't need any direction. You know, I mean, um, and we just did it. I don't remember getting notes from Sam about it. We just, you know, we were in the desert, pootling about and, and you know, doing silly things. And, and, and I don't remember being directed as such by Sam. And then you have uh, Straw Dogs where you have Dustin Hoffman and they had, I don't think they had big issues between them, but you know, they, Dustin was, was the only kind of um, American in, in the whole thing and worked in a slightly different way, but that doesn't worry me. And, um, and then, then with James Mason, you know. I don't remember much directing going on for the actors, but as I said, and I, 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 I get your point about Stella and whatever happens in, in those dynamics, maybe with, with um, the women he worked with. Uh, but I just don't remember any kind of direction or, or to, to get the performance because he'd cast the person for, for, for it. He'd cast you for it. I mean, if you look at the acting in Sam Peck and Paul's films and, you, and then you come to a conclusion, are the performances any good? Was he ultra cruel to people? I, I can't answer that. I have no personal experience of it. Um, so that it's really f for the audience member or the fan or whatever of Sam to, to kind of make up their own mind. If, if the performance is there, as long as all people weren't tortured and locked in rooms and beaten and hurt and abused and all that kind of, I mean, again, I, you know, you, you can read things and people have reputations, that, but. W I can only come from my point of view of my memories of him being aware of his reputation. And I'm not trying to defend or go against. I can only, for example, loyalty. Can I just, uh, I mean, when we were talking about Cable Hogan, the difficulties on that, and then, you know, half the crew, three people from the crew wouldn't be there the next morning and new people would come in. Half of those people were on the next movie. He wanted them back and they wanted to come back. 
So it's, it's a very strange dynamic. There was obviously something strange going. People would be fired, but they'd be on the next one. Well, Katie Haber was fired, you know, must have been fired a dozen times. Well, I don't, yeah, well, you're fired, and, and you know, whatever. I never heard that, thank God. But I was talking about, thinking about the, the, the other side of Sam, that the, the, the one thing was waiting for, for this act to, to come from England by boat, ship, whatever you want to call it, you know, for two weeks, is one thing. Then the next time I worked with was Straw Dog. Now, uh, about three or four months before he even approached me for it, I had an accident where I couldn't walk, you know that. And I had sticks and I had special shoes and I was learning to walk again. I was given 50-50% chance of either walking and never walking again, and all that stuff. I never thought I'd ever work again because uh, I was uninsurable because this accident happened when I was making a film but not on the set. Lots of rumours went around that I was drunk, which is not true, and there were witnesses to that, on drugs, not true, never did that. But it's a long story which is not appropriate for here. Anyway, so I was in hospital and I got a, a, a learning to, or wherever, it, learning to walk again and, and having exercises, and I got this offer to do this film and I, uh, from Sam, a straw, a straw Dog, or Siege of Trenches Farm, or anyway, Straw Dogs it turned out to be. And I said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't walk. He said, you'll walk. I said, he said, we'll get you in front of a camera. I was uninsurable and unemployable. Again, because of rumour and also, who's got, you know, I, I couldn't walk properly, so who would insure me? So anyway, I, I got the script and it was a good part in Straw Dogs, you know, a, you know, a bit different from, from Cable. And he asked me again and it was going to be in England and it was Dustin Hoffman and... Um, and I, I said, are you sure? I said, and I met him and, and I had my two sticks, which as anybody who's seen the movie knows that the character I play is, is, is an invalid or couldn't walk properly. And Well, that was real, but Sam, I'm talking about loyalty of Sam and, and the other side of Sam. So anyway, it was arranged uh, that uh, I would be doing the film with my limp and my not being able to walk properly. And I remember we were on the train, the crew were going down on the train to Cornwall, St. Burian, which you know. And Sam said, came over, he was on the train, you know, he didn't fly down in, on his own. And he, and he said, now listen, he said, I don't know if you know this, but you're uninsurable. They won't insure you. I said, well, how am I here? How am I doing? He said, well, two things, he says. You're going to be fine, and I'm covering you. I'm covering your whatever the word is for the insurance company. Meaning, if I anything, if I do anything, he has to pay, you know. Uh, and the film shuts down, and it's all on him. Well, I think that's quite a gesture of some kind of friendship and, and camaraderie and, and loyalty um, for him to say that, just to let you know. You're uninsurable, but if anything happens, I'm paying. And the irony of that was that I was fine. The whole crew, they shut down production because the, because the crew, uh, a lot of crew members were ill down in, in Cornwall. Now, I was the only one standing. They were all in bed puking and doing it. Now, what they had to do, the insurance company, who would not insure me, Lloyds, send rep reps down there just to check out and with doctors. So I said, I want to meet them at the station. So I went, to, I, I was the lone member of the crew, the uninsurable one, met the Lloyds reps and the docks and then took them to the hotel, the, uh, the Tregetta Castle Hotel, to go and look at the people in bed and all that, and puking and everything. So the uninsurable one, on his, off with his sticks, was standing there saying, welcome, to, welcome. I thought, anyway, but that, I, I hadn't, I, I, I'd forgotten that. I was really meaning to talk about Sam and his, his, his loyalty. And then with Cross of Iron, there was a, a contract issue. And um, I said, Sam, they won't let, they're not going to agree to this. And I said, he just said, if they don't agree to this, 
there'll be no David Warner. And if there's no David Warner, there's no Sam Peckinpah. Now, whether he was joking or not, but what he was saying is, I'm on your side. So I never had a day's problem with Sam, personally. We've had a very lyrical film, Cable Home. Yeah. Now we're into something which is really, you know, a, a man defending his territory, his woman, everything. Which I don't believe he would have made had Cable Hogue been successful. Let's start with that. Well, no, that's all. I mean, I don't think maybe Straw Dogs would not have been made had Cable Hogue have been somebody say, wow, the man who made The Wild Bunch, one of the great westerns of all time, has made this other film, which is a lyrical, a lyrical comedy, uh, fantastic uh, death of the old west uh, character study. Wow, and th that didn't happen. And I and I think that maybe I have no, you know, maybe Sam just said hell with it. I mean, I know I read somewhere say I'm a whore now, meaning if I I've got to work and this is the kind of stuff. I mean, I've always thought that if I mean, it was really the kind of uh, situation, the kind of the setup of of straw dogs, which of course had it have happened, say, in a Mexican town. It would have been just, uh, you know, a B-movie and, and uh, you know, that's all fine. But the fact that it was in England was a total... Thing. And you mentioned Clockwork Orange and the Devils. Well, of course, Clockwork Orange... What, I remember um, during the making of it reading, I think it was Gordon Williams who wrote Siege of Trenches Farm, which uh, Straw Dogs was based on, saying he totally disapproved of what Peck and Paul was doing with the film. Uh, and I, I wouldn't su be surprised if there would be kind of farmhouses with, with, with locals coming in and bashing in their ears. Meanwhile, the critics loved Clockwork Orange and its message and what was there. Well, of course, it was people wore hats and makeup and bashed up old ladies as a result of seeing Clockwork Orange. Nothing happened as a result of Straw Dogs. And of course, I know it was kind of banned and everything. But the film that all the, you know, that, 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 that was a masterpiece from from Kubrick. I'm not going to deny that, that's not the issue. But but that was the one that people imitated, or young, you know, the object, whatever, imitated, and not straw dogs at all. I mean, nothing, nothing happened. But you were talking about the, um, the, the, uh, the rape scene, the sex scene. Again, I, I was not anywhere, I, I just sort of was in my own, you know, in my room. Um, you know, concentrating on... I don't think at the time anybody was talking about it when it was being filmed, not to my earshot, maybe others. So it was just, you know, uh, you only learn later a lot of, about what actually goes on, what you read and, and hear. When you... Um, thinking about your contribution to Cable Hoke, you were a, an Englishman in America um, as a character and as a person. And now we've got Dustin as an American in England. And a lot of people have said that, you know, the, that Sam portrayed the Cornish people and landscape as a West, like a Western. What, what, like a Western? Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, you know, you could see it taking place, say, in a Mexican village or in a, in a small town or whatever it is in, in America. So that's what I always thought. He'd just taken that, that idea and plopped it into England, which made it totally unacceptable. The audiences, if it was in Mexico or somewhere else, they, they wouldn't have been so outraged. It's, that's, that's all I'm thinking. It, 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 I think they were more outraged because it was an attack, an attack on the Brits or something. I just don't know. I was wondering about that feeling of, um, of, of the Vaughan family, which is basically an evil kind of Western or Mexican family. Um, what was the reaction of the people who were actually on the film to that? Did, was it we uh, the we didn't talk about the film much when we were making it. I mean, um, bearing in mind that my my character was isolated from all that, I was the one that they were after. So so I wasn't involved in all that kind of setup of any discussions about that. So I don't know. But, you know, Brit actors don't talk much about that in the mail. They're off at the pub talking football rather than, you know, I don't think every evening they would be talking about uh, the next day's scene even. You know, they just get together and do it. Am I being sort of facetious here? I don't mean to be. I was never in on, because I was so isolated as a character, 
and I'm not a method actor, but I was a bit isolated really as David, because they were all getting on with other stuff, which I wasn't privy to. Uh, as I say, I've only seen the film once, um, um, so I can't really, I don't really remember too much about it. What did it. you think of it when you did see it? Um, not my kind of picture, really. <laughs> it's, I, I wouldn't go and see it, you know, myself. But it was a duty. No, I mean, I listen. I mean, I'm being a bit facetious. I mean, to I'm grateful for the work because we also had that. All oh, it was a small, a small little thing that happened. One of our film critics hated it. Alexander Walker. Uh, that's a, a an English critic, late critic. And uh, he hated it. And he said, no, and I, knew, I was an acquaintance of Alexander's. And he said, no wonder David Warner had his name taken off that picture. Well, it so happens that, uh, no, my name isn't on the credits of Straw Dogs, not even on the cast list. And people thought, or one or two, including Alexander Walker, thought that I had my name taken off. And that is not the case at all. If you want to hear the story, of why, read my uh, memoirs. No, <laughs> if you want to hear, no. Uh, what happened was when we were setting up the film, uh, the agent has to talk about the billing. That's part of the, you know, the part, the money and the billing. Well, there was no, the part was fine, no money, billing. And it turned out that, that we requested a certain kind of billing. I mean, I, I don't care too much about all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, it was Dustin Hoffman and then, then Susan George. And I think my agent, because I had done some, some films some movies at the time, wanted me to kind of be somewhere with them. And there was an objection either from their agents or whatever. I don't know. Really. So my agent said, look, they're not going to have you in the same size or anything as them. Uh, what should we do? And I suddenly said, you know what? And having worked with Sam before and knowing his kind of, the way he th viewed things, I said, why don't I not have my name on the credits at all? They're not going to give me any kind of... Uh, um, he said, well, I don't think that'll work. I said, well, so I, caught, I talked to Sam and said, listen, Sam, how about this? How about I do the film? but I just not on the credits because they're fighting about the credits because it's what a great idea we'll go with that. So it was prearranged before we started filming that I would not have my name on the credits. That's my kind, my little statement about billing. And what is funny is because most people do know that I'm in the film. Uh, well, I don't mean the world knows who I am, but people who go to movies know I'm in it, even though my name isn't in the cast list. Uh, and it wasn't a publicity thing, it wasn't anything. It was just a kind of little bit of bullshit kind of, uh, you know, rebellion. I, I, I'm not playing this billing game. It's happened in other projects too. But I'm not playing the billing game. I won't have my name on the credits of Straw Dogs. So it was prearranged. It wasn't a protest. Although it's not my favourite film to watch. I can see that it was, or hear it was a great picture. But... Uh... Can we move on to Cross of Iron? You told me that there were um, conflicts and uh, difficulties with the producer. Wolf Hartwig, I think. Is Please tell was. us about that. Oh, well, no, I didn't have any conflicts. No, 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 but you saw, I mean, when it, they played tricks on... Was, well, no, there were, yeah, I mean, again, it, to try and sort of set it all up. We yeah, were yeah. in the bunker, we're under attack. And uh, Wolf Hartwig, who I had no problem with, you know, I mean, Sam, let's get it clear. I'm not going to say I, I remember Wolf Hartwig's name, not because of anything he particularly did. Sam had a reputation of actually having trouble with producers. So that's that's a given. And so but this they obviously had some problem. And uh, so it, it, Wolf Hart would come on. and He was, you know, sort of perky, perky man, German man, and he said, I've got a part, I've got, Sam's given me a part. Uh, and of course, a non-speaking part as, as the general or whoever it was. Um, but the whole idea was for Sam to get him in this, uh, where James Mason and myself were mainly in this bunker with lots of kind of shaking and, and dust coming down with explosions going on. And um, so every, he got Wolf Hartwig the, the, the um, producer uh, in uniform there 
think it was on there. But what I didn't know until about a minute before it was going to happen was it was really a ruse to have all sorts of crap fall on top of him, you know, nothing to hurt him, but dust and, and soil and earth and, and stuff. And so they set the camera up uh, on Wolf. He was on the phone or something, just doing in the middle of this, this, this artillery barrage coming in and stuff. And Sunset action, and then he did that, and then suddenly there was a huge explosion, and all the crap came down on top of, of, of on Hartley, not to hurt him, but just he was having a joke. I don't think it was in the movie. I don't think it was in the thing, but Sam had jokes too. I mean, nobody got hurt with his jokes, but um, I think he was. Look, I only know somebody. I was there for two weeks by reputation. They, they got on just about, you know, but... Uh. I was, we were talking with Bobby Bisiglia and he s said something quite worrying about Sam's state of mind or health at the time, which was that he'd uh, uh, taken uh, a few days to kill off members of a particular unit during, in the course of the action of... Uh, cross of iron but towards the end he'd forgotten which ones he'd killed off so he said to Bobby tomorrow we're going to kill off S S Lieutenant Santo who said look but we we did away with him last Tuesday so obviously there was something happening there with Sam which wasn't quite right in, in well I was uh, I, I can believe you uh, I was only there for two weeks for my concentrated bits. Those air all I know is that um, I know he had his daughter was there with him, so um, I think I'm correct there, Sharon. Uh, I have no idea about that. I mean, I can, I can believe it. I mean, you just I you know from what I read about you know his health and everything. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, again, I'm not trying. To, I mean, I'm as honest and truthful as I can be. I, Sam was Sam. I mean, I know he liked his B12 injections and stuff, but that's as far as I knew at that time of anything apart from having a, the odd drink or getting drunk or whatever. Um, so whether his health was declining there, it wasn't anything that I was particularly aware of, but not surprised because knowing Sam, but I wasn't really, I didn't see behaviour like that. You hadn't noticed any difference in, t in terms of the way he was directing on set or commanding his set between the films? The, the, the worst time, I think, was Straw Dogs for him. Now, whether that was because he was out of his own cut, you know, or whatever, uh, health-wise. But again, I wasn't... It's not like... It's not like every crew and actor was healthy anyway. It's not... It's, <laughs> You know what I'm there trying to say. There seems to be a lot of illness. Yeah, well, you know, but I, no, you, well, no. I mean, the, the, you know, I mean, all sorts of stuff was going on during that time. I mean, so I, I mean, I believe that he. I believe when I hear it, and I, I, I'm not surprised. But I didn't see any evidence. He didn't sort of say, "Do a scene now that we did two days ago" or anything. Can we talk? You you mentioned that you 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 lived in America for some time, of mm. course. Uh, you learned how to drive, you did all sorts of new things there and appeared in a lot of films and presumably you did see Sam on occasion. Saw so him on a couple of occasions. Can you tell us how he was and how um, what happened then? I, again, I have very great difficulty in saying when the order of things happened. I, I do know um, that I went up to see him in San Francisco, just him and me, I just felt I knew I wanted to see him uh, for no other reason than to see him. Um, and he was living on his own in, a, in an apartment overlooking the... I mean, nothing happened, I'm just saying, you asked me a question there. I went to visit him in Paradise Cove where he lived in a trailer, uh, just, just to say hello. And I know that my, my wife, Sheila and I took him for dinner in Los Angeles and he came on his own and I think he'd have a, a pace maker put in and I think he did talk about taking cocaine. I don't know what his career was. I can't, as I say, I can't remember what year it was, 
so I don't know what he was working on. David, can we have a, a sort of ask you to think about Sam now as, you know, 35 years or whatever since he, he's died, a long, long time. Um, but your memories are obviously very acute about him. But thinking about him as how he fits into not just your career and the importance of that, but into cinema, into his contribution and so on, how would you summarise it? Well, you have to understand that although I'm an actor and I've been in movies, in films, I'm not really a cinema buff and I'm not a great cinema goer, to be honest with you. So you've asked me a question about how he fits in and I just can't answer that in any kind of way on, on, on a kind of the general, because I don't know enough about cinema. And I'm, so all I know is that there's something really, really special about what Sam has done in film, but I couldn't explain what it is. As I say, I can cry when I, when I watch, uh, you know, if I click over and there's a wild bunch on television, which gratefully it is, on cable or whatever. On ca I always say <laughs> it's on cable and cable is also on quite a lot too. And for some reason, I get very emotional. And whether it's because of the, the f movie, the film itself, or whether it's something I feel viscerally about Sam and his reputation, which we know is deserved, but I, somehow there's something else in there that moves me about him. Am I making sense? I, I get terribly moved when I think of whatever it is that, 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 that gave him his problems or, or, or his behavior or his, his um, I, I just sort of, there's an instinctive feeling that I can't put in words. That if I see a photograph of Sam, I don't get master of violence. I get something totally different, but I find it very, very difficult to, to, to describe it. I see there is a sense, look, it's on record about how, how destructive he was in relationships, and I, I, I totally acknowledge that, and I make no excuses for that, and yet there's something inside me when I see a photograph of Peckinpah that turns on a whole different um, flood of emotion in me, uh, and I can't explain it, but it's one of, it's one of, of affection, of struggling to understand. Uh, uh, but again, having told you about how he's be, treated me just on a, on a, on a helping me through getting me in store dog, getting me to, to America. This is something that, that gives you a, a feeling about somebody, somebody, uh, the way they have treated you, knowing about all the other negative aspects. It's still, when I look at him, I have a, a, a totally, I can't explain it. Does it make sense? Am I? Am I, I hope it makes sense. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's. I just have a totally different emotion, which if I was one of his children, I would not have. You know, because of we know. I mean, the neglect and uh, absolutely. But yeah, just as a colleague, to say I was a close friend would not be fair. That would that would not be accurate. But he was friendly enough that I that his plays a really important part in my life, not just as a colleague, as an employer, but as some, I think I learned something about myself through him. I mean, it's not like we spent lots of evenings together talking philosophy or movies or anything. It's just that there was a, just a natural warmth towards me from him, and that was something I needed, and it happened to come from him. So this this is a medal, obviously, that says Cross of Iron. And then I turn it round and it says David Ballad of Cable Hogue, Straw Dogs, uh, in deep appreciation. I don't keep memorabilia, as you know, in many photographs. This is not a piece of memorabilia. This is a little gift and, and very welcome. And I, I wouldn't lose this for the world. It's very precious to me.